Hello, dear friends. Our conversation today is about the herpes simplex virus. There are eight types of herpes viruses in humans, but we're interested in herpes simplex virus today. They are the first and second types. Simplified, we can say that the herpes simplex virus of the first type affects people up to the waist, and the herpes simplex virus of the second type affects people below the waist. That is exactly why it is also called genital herpes. The herpes simplex virus is extremely prevalent. Up to 90% of the world's population carries herpes simplex virus type 1, and up to 30% are carriers of herpes simplex virus type 2. Despite the high prevalence, lesions caused by the herpes simplex virus do not occur in everyone. In approximately 20-30% to 30 of people who carry the virus, it most often manifests itself in the form of unpleasant, painful bubbles located on the same elevation and often grouped and merged. These bubbles burst and leave behind difficult-to-heal erosions. The said erosions may exist from 12 to 17 days. Of course, they cause discomfort to the person. Thank God, there are rarely generalized herpetic lesions when the infection spreads to the central nervous system and affects the lungs, urogenital system, liver, and other internal organs. Most often, it occurs in immunocompromised patients, people who have decompensated acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, and this virus is susceptible in people being treated for cancer and receiving chemotherapy. In addition, this virus is dangerous to patients who receive immunosuppressive therapy for organ transplants. Sometimes, newborn babies can be exposed to herpes. Herpes viruses, unlike coronaviruses, affect only humans. The primary host and reservoir is humans. The disease is transmitted from person to person. Type 1 herpes virus infects people in the home. Often, mothers pass the virus to their children. Also, infection occurs by kissing and in other ways of getting saliva on people's mucous membranes. Infection with herpes virus type 2 is most often a consequence of direct sexual contact. However, sometimes rashes on the genitals can be due to herpes virus type 1. Infections occur only from a living person. There can be no indirect infection through surfaces or any personal hygiene items. The fact is that the virus dies very quickly outside the human body. Thank God, it is very delicate. If someone does not like the word dies when we talk about the virus, we can say that when the virus dries, it loses its activity. An important feature, herpes simplex viruses are transmitted by people, not only in the presence of obvious symptoms, that is, not only in the case of herpetic lesions, but unfortunately by carriers who do not have any external manifestations which can also infect their loved ones or sexual partners with the herpes virus. Of course, if there is a herpetic lesion, the probability of infection is higher. Nevertheless, if a person is a carrier of the herpes virus and has never had herpetic lesions in his life, it does not mean he will not infect other people. How does the virus manifest its pathogenic action? Once on the mucosa or skin, it causes the lesions I mentioned earlier. And it doesn't stop there. The virus begins to migrate along the nerve trunks, along the nerves. Most commonly, these are sensitive nerves. The virus travels until it encounters ganglia. Ganglia, or nodes, are where the neuron bodies are contained. Our neurons are cells that have a body and outgrowths. Along these sensitive outgrowths, the herpes simplex virus reaches the neuron bodies and settles there. The primary infection is often asymptomatic, and the virus remains in a latent phase for life. It simply sneaks along the nerve endings into the neuron bodies, settles there, and lives without touching anyone. The favorite localization sites of herpes simplex virus type 1 are the trigeminal nuclei, and the favorite localization sites of herpes virus type 2 are the nodes of the sacral plexus. They're labeled SII and SV. It is the dormant state of the herpes simplex virus that can remain for quite a long time. It is because our immune system, although it cannot completely defeat the herpes virus, nevertheless, it has several protective properties. These include NK cell lymphocytes, such as CD8 plus cells, a type of T lymphocyte that controls this virus. But sometimes, our immune system can't contain this virus, 
and it starts to actively divide and spread along the same nerve trunks where it came from. It means the virus can again migrate to the same segments from where it originally came from. It is why herpes often recurs in the same place. For example, some people have it only on the upper lip, on the eyelid, on the nose, or the back of the throat. It is associated with a lesion of a specific nucleus of the trigeminal nerve. The trigeminal nerve has three branches, the oculomandibular, the maxillary, and the mandibular branch. Depending on which nucleus of the trigeminal nerve will be affected, here in that segment will be realized herpetic picture. About genital herpes, the situation is the same. Depending on which node of the sacral plexus is affected, the herpetic pattern will be localized, for example, on the genitals, thigh, or buttock. It all depends on the specific place where the virus sits. It is the reactivation of the virus that is called a relapse. Relapses can occur in people once a year, can occur once every few months, and can happen almost every month. Everything, as you understand, depends on the state of the immune system. The herpes simplex virus, once in the body, does not go anywhere else. Often, the trigger for a relapse is the circumstances that throw our immune system out of balance. Usually, this can be ultraviolet, sunlight, alcohol, lack of sleep, or physical or mental stress. It can also be caused by any acute respiratory viral disease or simply traumatization of the skin or mucous membranes. If we analyze, each person has a specific set of such triggers. A person may notice that he gets herpes after a change of climate or after certain physical activities and so on. It is an important aspect that should be noted. You have to analyze what the trigger is and what impact causes your herpes exacerbation. It is essential to avoid these influences and prevent the herpes virus from recurring. Since the herpes virus has been in our body for a long time, our immune system produces antibodies against it. These are class G immunoglobulins, which we can detect in the laboratory. But unfortunately, having these class G immunoglobulins does not help us to be completely free from infection. In part, they help prevent the spread of the virus, but if the herpes viruses have already gotten into our nerve ganglia once, they stay there for the rest of their lives. The immune system's task is to control and suppress them so that, God forbid, they do not begin to show activity. The clinical picture of herpetic lesions is obvious. Often, diagnosis is not difficult and does not require any laboratory tests. Herpetic lesions on the lips, eyes, or genitals are so noticeable that anyone can safely identify as having herpes. There are some embarrassments, though. There is a possibility of confusing these lesions with fungal lesions. But in any case, the diagnosis is made clinically. Just by looking at the patient, the doctor can immediately determine everything. Diagnosis of herpes simplex virus is simple. Typically, the symptoms of the viral infection are blisters and swelling. Sometimes, people feel definite precursors 12 or 24 hours before they get herpetic lesions. It is a very unpleasant sensation in that area that will subsequently have herpetic rashes. These sensations can appear as burning, incomprehensible pain, or sensory disturbance. People who have encountered such a problem can 100% predict that there will be a herpetic rash. Even though the clinic of the lesion is very obvious, still use any laboratory methods. The most common is the determination of immunoglobulins, particularly immunoglobulin G to the herpes simplex virus. The presence of an increased amount of immunoglobulin G says that the person is a carrier. It does not tell us anything about the stage of the disease and its prevalence. The most accurate reaction, which is now approaching the gold standard, is the determination of viral DNA by polymerase chain reaction from the lesion. If we isolate viral DNA, for example, from erosions suspicious of the virus, then the diagnosis is 100% positive. A little bit about herpes simplex virus in pregnancy. Pregnancy tests often detect the presence of immunoglobulin G to herpes simplex virus type 1 or type 2. If these G immunoglobulins are found, you should rejoice. Why? The presence of antibodies means the pregnant woman has been in contact with one of these viruses before. And if she has been in contact, antibodies have already formed. 
these antibodies pass through the placenta into the fetal tissues, protecting it from the herpes virus. Therefore, if such a pregnant woman during pregnancy or gestation will have lesions genital or on other parts of the body, it is not terrible for the child. Although in the body of the mother activation of the herpes virus occurs, it will not penetrate the tissues of the fetus, as they are already protected by antibodies. Here is a completely different situation if the future mother has no antibodies to the herpes virus and suddenly becomes infected during pregnancy. In this case, there is a very high probability of infecting the fetus because the antibodies have not yet developed. If the herpes virus is harmless to the mother's body, it can cause severe damage to the future child. It is also dangerous if genital herpes virus recurred in a pregnant woman in the last four weeks of the pregnancy. In such cases, the probability of direct transmission of the herpes virus to the child at birth increases. Since the child's immune system is not yet formed, the threat of widespread herpes infection of the newborn increases. It is an awful situation. Therefore, many countries have now adopted protocols that if a pregnant woman has a recurrence of genital herpes from the 36th week, she must necessarily receive antiviral treatment. If this treatment does not help and herpetic rashes persist to the time of expected delivery or the woman feels that these rashes are about to begin, the delivery is made by cesarean section to protect the child from transmission of the herpes virus because, for newborns, the herpes virus is really very dangerous. How do you determine how affected or not your immune system is? As mentioned above, the herpes simplex virus most often occurs in the same segment, depending on the nerve node on which it sits. If a person is infected in two or more simultaneously, for instance on the face, if it affects the ocular, maxillary, and mandibular branches of the trigeminal nerve, it already indicates severe immunosuppression. You have to deal with immunity very seriously. Treatment of herpes virus depends on its form. The easiest is a latent carrier of the herpes virus. This form does not require any treatment. The second case is recurrences of the herpes virus. There are no frequent recurrences once a year, for example, or recurrences that are associated with the fact that a person can clearly say that he has rashes after he's been in the sun or overdrank something or did not get enough sleep and so on. With this form, you must eliminate these provoking factors from your life. If this does not work and there are still recurrences of herpes, then you need to use antiviral drugs. Treatment with antiherpetic drugs. None of the drugs to date does not ensure the body's cleansing from the herpes virus and they all act in such a way that inhibits its reproduction. Well known to date, such drugs as acyclovir, valacyclovir, and valtrex. Valacyclovir, in fact, is the same as acyclovir, which in our body is transformed from valacyclovir to acyclovir, and the only difference is that it is more convenient for patients to take. There is also famvir. Famvir is converted to pencyclovir in the body. But if these drugs do not work and resistance develops, heavy artillery is used. Foscarnet or Cydofavir. How do these drugs work? Acyclovir or pencyclovir work in such a way that they utilize the viral thymidine kinase. Thymidine kinase is an enzyme that is found in the herpes virus. This enzyme ensures that acyclovir is phosphorylated. Phosphorylation means the transfer of phosphoric acid residue. The first step is accomplished by the viral thymidine kinase, and the subsequent steps already take place in our cells. Acyclovir triphosphate inhibits viral DNA synthesis. It breaks the viral DNA strand, and synthesis does not proceed further. The drugs cytofavir and foscarnet have a direct action on DNA-dependent DNA polymerase. It is a viral enzyme that ensures the replication of viral DNA. Once again, please note that these drugs merely stop the virus from reproducing, but do not destroy it in any way. The virus remains in the cell. It doesn't go anywhere. It is restrained and cannot multiply. The effectiveness of these antiviral drugs is based on the fact that they should be used when the virus is most actively replicating. It does this in the first 12 to 24 hours of its relapse or first entry into the body. That is, if we start taking antiviral drugs in advance, ideally, as soon as we feel that something on the problematic area of our skin begins to hurt 
or somehow behave differently, or, God forbid, we have already noticed some of the first rashes, we need to act as soon as possible. We have in reserve from 12 to 24 hours during which it is necessary to apply drugs either as tablets or as local treatment, ointments, and creams. If you start using these drugs at the height of relapse, when the bubbles have formed, even burst, it is too late. In the extreme case, we can only prevent further development of this relapse, but we cannot reverse the viral processes in any way. The tactics here should be this. If you know that you often have relapses of the herpes virus, as soon as it seems to you that something is wrong, you should immediately use antiviral drugs. What about other treatments? For example, a vaccine. Unfortunately, there is still no vaccine developed that would have more or less significant statistical efficacy. In my practice, I use the Russian-made Vitejerpovac vaccine. I want to say that the results are not so bad, but unstable. Someone helped me forget about relapses. Someone made relapses much less severe and less frequent in time, but I have not observed any 100% results. Although the use of this vaccine in the absence of contraindications is possible, but I'm not advising anyone to do anything here. You should always consult your doctor before doing anything. Vitejer Pavak, in my subjective experience, has seemed to me to work very well, but in the pyramid of evidence, someone's personal experience is the lowest evidentiary link since randomized clinical trials are required to evaluate the effects of a drug. Another method is the use of the amino acid lysine. In some people, it does cause a reduction in herpes virus recurrences. In others, it has no effect. In general, such randomized clinical trials have not shown any positive effect of lysine on herpes virus recurrences. Again, some may be lucky and benefit from lysine, but overall, if you look at it, there are no encouraging statistics. About interferon inducers, so-called neovir, polyoxidonium, immunostimulants such as levamisole, and pseudodrugs such as protoflazid, no promising data on the treatment of herpes virus has been found. For people who have herpes virus recurrences very often, modern medicine recommends that they take antiviral drugs like Valtrex at a maintenance dose for a year or two. It is when a person takes Valtrex every day so that they do not develop relapses. This practice is justified, and it is harmless to people. But again, it should only be prescribed with the help of one's trusted doctor. Are there any specific immunostimulants that would tune the immune system to fight the herpes virus, that is, would activate specific subpopulations of T lymphocytes or produce some beneficial immunoglobulins? There is no such thing now. Now, the entire immunotherapy however unfortunate it may be, is in a state where we are trying, figuratively speaking, to repair a complex microcircuit with a sledgehammer. In other words, everything is so uncertain and everything is so written in pitchforks that the hope for the use of any immunostimulants is not justified at present. There are no such means. Lastly, I want to warn you against pseudo-treatment. There are situations when people experience some unpleasant, incomprehensible symptoms. They have tests and find increased antibodies to herpes viruses type 1 or type 2, and even though people have never had rashes on their bodies, they still have to be prescribed anti-herpes treatment. As I said, any anti-herpetic treatment to date only works when the virus is multiplying during a relapse or clinical symptoms. If you do not have AIDS, are not severely immunosuppressed, or have never had skin, eye, or mucosal lesions, there is no point in using antiherpetic drugs. Antiherpetic drugs will not lead to the elimination of the virus from the body. It is fundamentally impossible. And, if you will be offered to undergo such treatment, it speaks either about the incompetence of the one who suggests it, or about some commercial intent. That's all. Thank you very much for watching. Be well. Always for you. Dr. Popmed.